Hey there, it's Jessica Honiger, founder of the socially conscious fashion brand Noonday Collection. And this is the Going Scared podcast, where we cover all things impact, entrepreneurship, and courage. Today's guest embodies all three of the aspects of our Going Scared podcast. This is Melissa Butler. Melissa Butler is the founder and CEO of The Lip Bar. The Lip Bar is challenging the beauty standard through products, inclusive imagery and pricing, as well as offering vegan and cruelty-free ingredients. She was featured on the Shark Tank and her journey is so much fun because she goes from Wall Street to being the CEO of a lipstick company. And you guys, she embodies so many of the values that I am wanting us to promote as going scared listeners. This week continues a special series of shows where we are walking through my new book, Imperfect Courage, one chapter at a time. If you don't have my book yet, you can head on over to Amazon. It is 15 bucks right now. Put it in your cart. This week is all about chapter nine, widening your circle. And we really talk about how we can widen our circle, both in our lives and in how we celebrate beauty. I love your story so much. The opening quote from my newest book, it says the path to success is straight and the experience of walking it is marked by both confidence and clarity said no one ever. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And I've done everything from midwifery to real estate. And now I run one of the fastest growing fair trade fashion brands in the world. And you went from Wall Street to the beauty industry. And I am just dying to hear, tell me the story around that. How, take, take us on this very windy path from Wall Street to now owning the lip bar. Right, so it's, it's insane because it's like, you grow up and you have like all these ideals of what you wanna do. Some of it is based on your interests. Some of it is based on what your parents want you to do. Um, some of it is just like societal pressures. And so like I'm working on Wall Street, not because I love numbers. Who loves who, who loves Wall Street? First of all, you know? <laughs> it's a rare few. It's a rare few. <laughs> so it's like I'm in financial services largely because my goal is to make money. My goal was to live out that American dream that the world was saying. Um, you know, that was the path that we should follow. So it's like, oh, you go to school, um, you get good grades, you get a great job, you get married, you have kids, white picket fence, the whole nine, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm on that journey and I'm I'm working on Wall Street, but very quickly I learned that I hated it, that it wasn't fulfilling, that there was really no purpose in it. And so what I'm understanding, the, the more mature I get, the more I understand that Everyone really just wants to have a purpose. Everyone Mm. really just wants to understand their why. And so while working on Wall Street, I had no why. I was just kind of just doing it. I was going through the motions. And I also learned that I was passionate, not just about beauty products, because I always tell people that I'm not passionate about makeup at all, Mm. but I am passionate about the way people think about themselves and how Mm. they see themselves in the world. And so I noticed this trend of the world essentially telling women that they needed to look like in a certain thing in order to be beautiful, or you Mm. even needed to act a certain way to be a woman, or you needed to dress a certain way. You know, it's like this idea of this is, this is ladylike, or this is feminine, or this is attractive. You know, we were always being shuttered in one direction to say like, you know, this is what it means to be a woman. Now stay in it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, that's BS. Like, mm-hmm. why, why are we following someone else's um, playbook? You know, c- certainly a playbook that we didn't create as women. Like, we didn't band together and say, hey, we need to be shaped exactly like this in order to be considered beautiful. And it's like, unfortunately, we started accepting um, the world perception of what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be beautiful. And so I started taking a more holistic approach to my own lifestyle Mm. while also really just, just honoring who I was as a person and accepting who I was as a person, regardless of what the world said. And I saw 
I noticed a, a huge gap within the beauty industry that was consistently telling women, you know, get this and this in order to be beautiful, like A mm-hmm. plus B equals beauty. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, but, but what about that woman who is completely comfortable in her own skin? Is she, is she not beautiful? Mm. And so I started the lip bar with the goal to challenge the beauty standard, you know, not because again, I'm not passionate about makeup, but really because I understood that this is a very big and, you know, powerful industry. And if you want to transform it, you have to transform it from within. And my goal was always to transform the mindset about beauty instead of transforming the face. And so I started with lip color because I, I truly believe that you know, one stroke of lip color will, number one, it'll brighten your face, but also it'll give you enough confidence to take on that room. It's like red is truly a power color. Mm. And, and I, one of our best sellers um, or our best seller in the whole company is called a boss lady. And it's like this power red. And when you I put it that. on, yeah, you put it on and it's like, wait, I, I can do anything. I can really like take on the day with, with this extended amount of confidence or I can take on the day knowing that I can handle whatever adversity comes my way. And so it was my way of really um, trying to challenge what, what women and men think about beauty. Cause largely we also get this idea of what beauty is based on what men think beauty is. Mm. So yeah, all, all of these things just, just really got me going and kept me up at night. And I'm like, I can make lipstick in my kitchen, knowing I had no idea how to make lipstick in my kitchen. But <laughs> I didn't even know you could actually make lipstick in your kitchen. This is blowing my mind right now. Yes, I had no idea. I'm like working on Wall Street like 55 hours a week, coming home, like literally going on YouTube, figuring out how to make lip balm, reading books on cosmetic chemistry, carrier oils, essential oils, reaching out to cosmetic chemists. Um, really dissecting everything that I saw on the backs of labels of other lipsticks that I had been buying. Like, well, what's this ingredient? What does it do? Like, what's the value proposition? And what's the property? And and really just like taking a, a super deep dive into um, the chemistry of makeup. And I literally, I bought molds, like just very expensive aluminum molds and wow. all these in- ingredients. And I just started experimenting. And like, literally putting like crazy colors on everyone from my mom, my sister, my little cousins, my best friends. And let's be clear, my first, let's say 500 batches of lipstick were horrible because I didn't know how to make lipstick, but, but you know, it got better every time it got better every time. And it's like really understanding that, you know, I had a really strong why I really wanted girls to grow up understanding that they didn't have to do anything in order to be accepted or they didn't have to do anything um, Mm. in order to be beautiful or they Mm. didn't have to do anything to be enough. Like it was already within them. And I knew that creating, you know, becoming a part of the beauty industry and creating, you know, this diverse imagery or creating these vegan and cruelty free products and, and offering them at an affordable price point. That was all really speaking to this idea that you don't have to compromise in anything. So it's like, I'm 32 right now and I'm not married. I don't have any kids yet. Um, And I've spent a lot of my time focusing on growing this business. And because I am focused on my business, a lot of people assume that I don't want kids or Mm -hmm. I don't want to get married. And it's like, but that's this idea of lack that we've allowed the world to put on us that we can only have one or the other. Right. You know, and it's, it's mind boggling. And so we do that with everything. And so just like when I first started the lip bar, it's like everything is vegan and cruelty free. And we try to use natural and organic oils as often as possible. And in 2012, when I was telling this story, a lot of people were kind of like, well, if it has good ingredients, is it going to work? Right. Right. And it's like, why, why do we think that? Why do we think we can only have one thing? Why can't we have everything? I love that you're talking about this. That's a huge topic of my book is, is paradox. And that if we can't accept paradox, we'll remain in paralysis. Yep. But when we can break out of these categories that we think are in sharp Sharpie, instead write them in pencil, we can mm-hmm. embrace this and mindset. And I, that's what I just love about your brand and what you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
Okay. So I, I also have had to break out of some of the own, my own definitions of beauty that I put on myself. And a lot of that did come up from growing in a bit of a cookie culture, cookie cutter culture, where it was like, if you come from this background, then you need to look like this. And Mm -hmm. size two is really what's beautiful. And I definitely had some circumstances in my own life where I was called fat. And I just began to define my worth around how I looked. And it launched me into about 25 years of pretty compulsive dieting, thinking if I could just look this way, then I would be able to live this pain-free life. So Tell me a little bit about if you would be willing to, I'm asking you to be vulnerable. I don't even know you and we're going here. (laughs) You know, usually you, we teach what we need to learn. And I'm assuming that you've had some hard things growing up where you, you know, what do you think did influence this narrow definition of beauty? And then I want to hear about the courage it's taken for you to just bust through that. Yeah. And, and to be clear, I'm still busting through it. Well, like amen. every day. <laughs> a, yeah. Every, every day. day. So like I grew up in Detroit and I'm a black woman and you know, we in the black community, oftentimes like we deal with colorism. It's like, you mm-hmm. know, the more fair skinned woman mm-hmm. will get, um, that prominence. And so like, I am, I'm like medium tone for a Mm -hmm. black woman. And so it's like the standard of beauty was lighter than me. And so I had to think about, you know, what it meant for me to be beautiful or to remind myself that I was beautiful. And my mother is um, lighter complected than me. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times our beauty standards come from our parents first. Totally. And so knowing that I looked a little bit different from my mom, you know, that was my first thing. It was like, oh, okay, well, why don't I look like her? Why can't I look like her, especially if the world is saying that she's beautiful? And so I I had to break out of that. And and my mom actually helped me with that because my mom would always like compliment me or, you know, say that she loved the richness of my complexion Mm -hmm. and and things of that nature. But that was something that I had to come to terms with, you know, like in high school and middle school where, you know, where it was like, oh, the boys like this girl and not me, you know? And so that, that's something where it's like, you have to pick your battles right. that you're going to, that you're going to fight. And then you're going to have to fight them with everything in your body. And so now I'm very comfortable with my complexion, but you know, moving on to my thighs, I've, I've <laughs> always, I've always like hated my legs. Like as a little girl, I didn't yeah. wear shorts. I, I literally didn't wear shorts and it's like summertime will roll around and everyone will be so excited to like, put on like their Daisy Dukes or like, Mm -hmm. you know, put on their bikinis. And I would kind of be like in the corner, like, no, but I have big legs, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's it's such a silly thing because I've had tons of people compliment me on my legs. Like, oh, you know, I I have chicken legs is what they would say. And you have like these full legs. But I I only looked at myself from from this position of wanting something that I didn't have. Right. And I think, I think a lot of um, our challenges with beauty is really just seeing what someone else has and seeing beauty in that and our inability to see beauty in ourselves, even yeah. though the, the rest of the world is saying like, oh, what you have is awesome. It's like, we're never satisfied for some reason. Like, where do we get that from? Right. Well, I think we have gotten it from not, I mean, in part to not having images that are real. And I love what's on your website right now. It made me feel known because you have a woman showing, you know, stretch marks on her breasts. And I'm like, uh, yep. Uh, that's very familiar image to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's me. That's you. That is me. That's me. And so it's so crazy. Hooray. But I love it. You're like, you're giving me some courage right now. Here's the thing, like I've never, the lip bar is six years old and I've never been at the forefront of the brand, uh, largely because I didn't want people to, like, I'm an attractive woman. I know that I'm an attractive woman and mm-hmm. I'm not saying that to be cocky, but no, like, I love it. Yes. I understand that being, um, being a founder of a business is aspirational, Right. Right. And so when you think about that, it's like, I never started the lip bar because I wanted people to want to be me right. or want to be like me or to admire me in a certain way. 
I started it because I really wanted them to look at themselves and see that beauty within. Mm. And so I'm, I'm consistently talking to women about accepting themselves and loving themselves, every part of themselves, and not really looking at these things as flaws, like these imperfections as flaws. It's like, you're imperfectly perfect, actually. Like everything is as it should be. And so I'm constantly talking about this while also dealing with these issues on my own. Right. So it's like I, for as long as I can remember, I've had stretch marks on my breast. Mm-hmm. It's not from like breastfeeding. It's not from anything. They've just been there, I think, since I was like 13 or 14 years old, whenever I got boobs. Yeah. And so <laughs> they probably, you probably just grew fast. I mean, I've had stretch marks too, since I was a teenager. Yeah. And so it's always been something that I've been self-conscious of. But in the last couple of years, I was just like, no, it's, it's fine. Like, this is a part of being a woman or being a human, not even just a woman. It's like, this is human nature. And so instead of just telling the story or like encouraging other people, like I want to show people that I can also do this. Like Mm -hmm. I can also be vulnerable. So I did this photo shoot. I'm showing my stretch marks. That photo, that picture is not retouched. It's not Photoshopped. And so I'm just like, look, this is, this is me. I have on makeup. It's not retouched. Yes, I have stretch marks on my breast, and all of that is okay. Mm, I love it. Your beautiful lips with your bright lipstick are okay. And your Thank sessions. you. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, everything. Or it's all the above, which is what is so powerful. And, you know, I talk about in my book that I often because I couldn't accept myself. Brene Brown did research that said we can only accept others to the agree to to the degree that we have accepted ourselves. Yep. And that was so convicting to me because yep. what I realized is that when I wasn't accepting my curves, I was keeping curvy girls at bay. I was actually not wanting to necessarily associate yeah. with curvy girls because of my own lack of self-acceptance. And we just put a plus size model on our lookbook for the very first time. And I think I was able to do that because I have finally accepted my curves. Now I'm not saying I wake up every day, just like, what? My, my thighs are sliding. (laughs) And I'm so glad about that, you know, like, and I think that's also what I'd love for listeners to understand is that just because we are making, trying to create change in the industry of beauty and fashion doesn't mean that we're 100% confident, yeah. but it's yeah. really this journey of being afraid, being imperfect, and just going forward anyway. Yeah. So tell yeah. me a little bit about that, about how, what's your journey of going scared in both in, you know, putting forth your imperfections and also in, you know, how you really then eventually quit Wall Street and made this your full-time gig. So the reality is I'm scared all the time because I'm doing, I'm, I'm trying to conquer these big hairy goals every other day. It's like, I don't celebrate, um, the highs too much, but I also don't mourn the losses. I understand that being afraid and really deciding to conquer that fear is really just going to end up with growth on the other side, whether I, I win or learn. It's like something good is going to come out of that experience. So as it relates to either being at the forefront of my business, as it relates to starting my business, as it relates to facing rejection within my business, Mm -hmm. everything has largely been a matter of just keep going. Just believe that, that you can achieve everything that you truly set out to do because you can. Mm. Really, everything is really just a mindset. Yeah, it, it, It's a matter of deciding what you're going to do, deciding why it matters to you, and then going after it. Because you can, you can give yourself a million reasons why you shouldn't, you know. Oh my gosh, for you to go into the beauty industry, that is such a competitive marketplace. Yeah. Okay. And people tell me that all the time. You know, like, why would you start a cosmetic company? You know, uh, we went on Shark Tank and they told us that um, we would never get market share and they, w- they would crush us like the colorful cockroaches that we were. Oh, you my know? gosh. 
Yeah, it, it was it was such a cruel moment. And in that moment, it's like we totally could have quit in the face of like this super public rejection or this public defeat. But it's like, why would I give someone else the power over my dreams or, or the power over my why? Why would I allow someone else to define my capability? Like it's a saturated market, but so what? I believe in segmentation, not saturation. That's so it's right. like the, the reality is there's a consumer who is still not being served, whether that's in the beauty industry, whether that's in the fitness industry, you know, it doesn't matter. There's always someone who's willing to hear your story. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about um, the emergence of social media and, and influencers, influencers are on the rise because people are consistently looking for um, someone to resonate with, someone mm -hmm. who they feel like will relate with their journey or what they've been going through. So it's like, you have to just understand that. No, it's, it, it's probably not going to be a, a walk in the park. It's not going to be this cakewalk, but it will be worth it. And you have to just decide to take that courage, put it in your back pocket and, and just start going for it. Mm -hmm. And every, every now and again, you may have to take a couple steps back, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And instead of trying to outshine, just shine. And you are shining. I mean, you guys have differentiated yourself in the marketplace. Your your lipstick is vegan and cruelty free. The colors are bold and unique. It's an approachable pi price point, and you're making products for women who are underrepresented. And I love this idea that you say that beauty isn't linear. So I feel like you really have differentiated yourself in the marketplace. And I just I've had really redemptive stories in my life that have to do with lipstick. <laughs> so that's why I just love that you are a founder of a lipstick brand. The first time I went to Uganda to actually meet the artisans that had been creating the goods I'd been selling for a year and all of those goods that I'd been selling the first year of my company with Noonday, it was actually to raise money for me to adopt a little boy named Jack, who's my son now from Rwanda. And so I was going to go meet these artisans that had really enabled my dream to happen. And I was putting on lipstick, Jalia is her name, and we were about to get our photos taken for the first time. And she kind of looked at me with a little bit of an insecure look in her eyes. And she's like, oh gosh, I, I haven't put on lipstick in years. And poverty had really set her down and was wanting to keep her down. Poverty yeah. is where she was drawing a lot of her negative self-worth from. And she said, can I borrow some of your makeup? And so she borrowed my lipstick. I did not have the right color foundation, but we <laughs> put on some lipstick and we put on some mascara and it was as if she just stood proud. She yeah. Stood so proud. And it's not because the lipstick made her beautiful, but it's because it recognized that inner girl boss. Like I love the name of your top selling. What is it again? Boss lady. Yes. Boss lady. It was this moment where she just stood proud and eight years later, she now has a hundred full-time employees. Wow. Most of them are women. And the last time we went, it was last summer. And we said, Jolly, is there anything we can bring? She goes, bring red lipstick because all of her employees now Went to wear lipstick like she does. And we had this, I love that. It was so awesome. I wish you could have been there. It was last August and we pulled out all this lipstick. I wish it would have been lip bar lipstick. Now I know. And <laughs> we pulled it out and we all had this lipstick party, this giant celebration. It was white woman, it was black woman, it was all different shades coming together, putting on lipstick. And it was like one of these most powerful moments in my life of women just coming together. And yeah, I can, I can imagine you have seen that too. Now that you've started this brand and you are becoming an influencer yourself, obviously you are an influencer. And even though I totally get this tension between being the founder and kind of building that part of your brand, and then also just the hustle of being behind the scenes, actually running your brand. But I can only imagine that you have heard some stories through the years of what it's meant to other girls, other teens, where they now are owning their worth and their beauty. Does anything come to mind as you've been out and about or any stories that you hear via Instagram or any of your social media about what your brand has meant to others? Well, I have a personal account 
And I, we do a lot of trade shows. And if you've seen any of our imagery, it's like very diverse. And our goal is really to transform the mindset. And so I understand that in order to do that, you can't just use like, you know, your typical run of the mill imagery. So hence me showing my stretch marks. Um, we've had a photo shoot um, with a Muslim woman um, in full hijab. And it's like, that's th- those are things that you typically don't see right. in a beauty campaign. You rarely see plus size women in beauty campaigns. You rarely see Asian women or Indian women in beauty campaigns. Mm-hmm. And it's like, those are all markets that are completely underserved. But yet right. still, those are women who, who wear makeup who, yes. uh, you know, who wear lipstick, who want to enhance their beauty. And it's like, they don't have that representation. So one day we're at a trade show and the banner that we had up at this particular trade show was of a very deep complected woman. She's probably the complexion of Lupita. And she had on like the boldest orange lip color mm. in this campaign that we did. And it it was so interesting because we had two customers at our booth at that very time. It was an an older woman and she was more mature. And I want to say, I think she said she was from Russia and she ended up asking us, she said, you know, why do you use, why did you use this model? And I said, you know, because this model actually never gets representation. And when people see this model, they typically don't see beauty. And I want to challenge the way people think about beauty because it doesn't look like just one thing. It doesn't just include one person or one body type. And so while I'm saying that, the customer right next to her ends up saying, you know, oh no, I could never wear that color. Now this, this woman Um, is a black woman who is a bit lighter than the model that we were using. And so she's like, I could never wear that color. And I said, why do you think you could never Mm. wear that color? And her response to me was that, you know, my grandma said that only fair skinned women could wear colors like that. Mm. And it just, and it just further proves the point. It was like, this is exactly why we have to have this imagery, because when you don't have representation, when you don't have plus size women or Mm -hmm. deeper complected black women or Indian women or Asian women or, you know, whatever variety of women that is not within that traditional beauty standard, Mm -hmm. it leaves out such a large part of the population and they feel like they have to operate in the parameters of what the world says is okay. And so while one woman was saying like, she didn't understand the imagery, another woman who you would think would understand it was saying like, Oh no, I also can't do this because I was taught and I was conditioned to feel like I can't step outside Mm. of this box. Mm. So like, it was, it was such a powerful moment for me. And it was like, it was like an aha moment. Like, you know what, this is, first of all, it's sad. Right. It's sad that you don't believe that you can, you know, do anything. Pull this off. You know? Right. But also, it's like, it just reaffirmed my work. It's about I, 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 I look at it as work, not just as, like, I'm selling makeup. I look at right. it as I'm empowering women to live their best lives. Yes. Absolutely. So I know you guys recently landed in select Target stores as well as being on Target.com. Congratulations. That's Thank you. Awesome. So Thank do you, you think that is a sign that people are responding to this message of widening our circles and being more inclusive? Like how have you seen in the last, I think you said six years is when you started it. How yeah. have you seen the narrative change in the industry? Yeah. I mean, just with the emergence of like Fenty Beauty, like Fenty Beauty broke records by, by really embracing, you know, that everyday woman Mm. or, you know, this woman who doesn't look like one particular thing. And so I think that overall, as, as a society, we're all moving to this, this phase of, we, you know, we want to, we want to know that the products that we're supporting aren't just good for us, but they're good for the world. They're good for the society. We want to know the meaning behind the brand. We want to know what the founder stands for. So it's like, when you think of like something like Tom's and it's like, oh, you know, you buy one, you give one. 
It's like that makes people feel good. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and also like when you shop at Whole Foods, it's like when you shop at Whole Foods, you think that you're doing something good for your body. And mm-hmm. so I think in so many facets, we're really embracing what it means to be a woman. I think there's no better time to be a woman, to be completely honest. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think everywhere we are, we're looking at um, what it means to be a woman, how we act as women. And really like how we take back our power. So I think there's just a cultural shift and beauty is one of those industries that's being um, impacted in a positive way. That's going to say, you know what, we're not going to stand for any of these rules that we didn't write previously. We're going to create our own rules as women um, in makeup. You know, you can wear makeup. You can decide not to wear makeup. You can shave your legs. You can decide not to shave your legs. And all of that is okay. So I'm just excited to see, um, the world for, for my children when I have them. Yes. Yeah. I heard today that U S studies indicate that over the past 10 years, all businesses grew by 12% while women owned businesses surged at a 58% growth rate. And I was surprised to hear that in some ways, but then I also was really excited to hear about that, that the landscape really is changing. And my question is, are we ready for it? Like, what are some areas where you think we need to saddle up and kind of shore in um, so those areas where we haven't really had that seat at the table. And so we really haven't had what we need to, to be at the table, or maybe I'm just, that's a really bad question. No, but I, I get where you're going with it. Um, so I do think we're ready for it. But one of the things that I would love to see us change is like, we're, we're so into labeling. Mm-hmm. We're so, and it drives me crazy. It drives me absolutely crazy because it's like, you know, even with the progress, we still feel the need to segment ourselves when it's like, we're all just one people, you know, mm-hmm. you know, so it's like, we're, so we're, what are some examples of that for you? Cause I know, are you, is, are you primarily tar- targeting African-American women through your brand? And is that the label you're talking about? I'm talking about all labels. So for instance. It's like when we think about um, when we think about growth and progress as women, right? And and this is this will be women specific. It's like, are you a feminist or are you not a feminist? Oh, uh, right, right, yep. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, um, I want to be a person who is one hundred percent believing in women's rights. But do I have to? First of all, I have to learn what a feminist is. You know, mm-hmm, so like. Right. Because everything is within these very strict And then you parameters. think if you are using that, then you have to su- subscribe to... To all these feminist ideals. And it's like almost post- creating all these rules that we're exactly. trying to get out of the rules, but then we're just stepping into more rules. Exactly. So it's like, um, some people would say like, as a feminist, you shouldn't wear makeup. Mm. And it's like, but, but why? Why can't I also like makeup? Or, you know, as a person of color, you know, maybe you should, I don't know. It's just, it's so many labels. We get so caught up in like, okay, what it means to be, you know, a Democrat or a Republican Mm -hmm. or a black woman or a woman or a feminist or a Mm -hmm. business owner. It's like, there's so many things and so many rules that we have to follow when we create labels around things. I would, I would love for us to not label ourselves and really to just embrace, you know, who we are as, as human. Right. Or it's as like listen women. instead of label, uh-huh. because I feel like labels set us up to not listen, but to more stand on platforms to talk at people. Whereas listening is creating a space for a human to be exactly as he or she is meant to be yeah. without attaching and- labels to it. And, and really labeling creates a new language, you know, a new yeah. language that you have to first understand and then follow and then use. And, and then you're, you're an outsider happens, or an insider. Exactly. And what happens is either you know the language of the land or you don't. Even as something as simple as like fundraising, like we just closed our first round of fundraising. And in that, it's like, hey, I have a business. We have traction. We're growing. We need money. Mm-hmm. And, but it's not, it's never that simple. It's like, you have to learn the language of the land, which is Silicon Valley, you know? And it's like, you can't just be a business owner. You have to be a tech business owner. 
Mm-hmm. So it just, it, so everything has has become so fragmented as we look at, or as we progress as a society. And I just I really want us to be a little bit more open minded with how we how we welcome people into our world. I love that. Widen our circle of compassion. That's how I talk about it in our book. I love that. I love that. So as you look back on your story, what have been some of the defining experiences that helped you get out of your comfort zone and widen that circle? So I'm going to be really honest. Um, I actually hate networking. I'm so bad at it. You would think as a business owner who used to work on Wall Street that I would be like, you know, that person just working the room. Um, I am horrible at networking because I'm a bit introverted. And yeah. so well, and it sounds like you really value authenticity and it exactly. probably feels not authentic to you. It, that's exactly what it is. I feel like it's forced conversation. And so, you know, you can, you obviously want to find common ground with people and relationship building is huge. Relationship building is actually the only thing that we have. I truly believe that the only mm-hmm. thing that we truly have in this world is our reputation. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, well with that, it's like, how do you, you know, get this stranger to understand the values of, you know, you as a person, it's like, okay, well, Melissa, what do you want this person to know about you, you know, within this experience? And so oftentimes it, it seems a little forced for me, but some of the best relationships come out of, you know, those peer to peer introductions or those, those really awkward moments where it's just like, Hey, I'm Melissa. And you know, this is what I'm interested in, or this is what I'm working on and, and really getting to know other people. And so that's one of those things where I've truly had to step out of my comfort zone yeah. and, and be vulnerable. Like being right. vulnerable is a, is a huge part of it. Even while building my team, it's like one of the characteristics I think of a great leader is, is one person who understands that you have to be that person to create a safe space for your team, mm-hmm. but also allow them to understand that you can also be vulnerable and you can also make mistakes so that everyone can work towards the same goal while understanding, you know, the opportunities that you may have as a person or as a business owner to get better. And so, you know, that goes hand in hand with networking because the goal of networking is to really build up this community around you so that when you need to plug into those opportunities or weaknesses that you may have, you have this community of people who are behind you to support you. Which is such a great way to reframe it. You know what I mean? Like, I just think that word networking, I I mean, I don't really know who just loves networking, but you just reframed it as building a community of support. And that sounds a lot more enticing. Yeah. But, and that's exactly what it is because it's like, no, let's be honest. You get a business card, you don't even use it, you throw it away. But it's like, in real life, you need to build this community, whether that's friends and family or other business owners or you know, it doesn't really matter who that community is, but what's important is that you have that community. And for the longest time, I would meet amazing people and, and not follow up with them or not know what to say with them or not know how to approach them. When I, I think it really came from this idea that I wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I don't, I don't know what to say to them or right. like, why would they find what I have to say interesting or, right. you know, I'm going to be awkward. And it's like, no, it's fine. Everybody is awkward and everyone has their, has their little quirks. And it's fine to just say like, hey, this is who I am. And I had to get over that. It took me a couple years to actually get over that. Mm. And it was just like, Melissa, this is something that you have to do. And if you don't, you'll hate yourself for it. You know, mm. you, you won't be able to sleep at night because this will be a missed opportunity for you. And so one day I just decided to, to work up the courage and work past the fear of, you know, I think it was shame. I think I was, I was afraid to be mm. embarrassed or I was afraid that I was going to stumble over my words um, in one of those moments. And it was just like, no, like you are enough. It's okay. Your words yeah. are valid. You know, it's like, so you're, crazy. You're an interesting I, person. You, yeah. You right. Can talk to right. Think about what you have to give. It's so crazy because everything you just described is what I was feeling before getting on this call with you. I, no. I was like, I'm so nervous. 
<laughs> I know she really represents black empowerment and I haven't always been doing that at noonday. And I, I was scared. I was scared that I was going to fumble over my words. That I, I mean, I have fumbled a little bit, but it's just, but I did too. Everyone does. And that's the whole point. That's Everyone point. does. Everyone yeah. does. Yeah. And it's just <laughs> it's about embracing the, the imperfection, which is one of the things that you have on your website right now is imperfectly perfect, which I just love. Obviously my book is called imperfect courage. And I think we have this idea of perfection in our mind or that we need to wait until we're, we have certain credentials or certain yeah. level of success, yep. or we can talk without fumbling over our words before we fill in the blank before yeah. we reach out to that person that we really respect, before we have a conversation for that podcast, whatever it might be, instead of just saying, you know what, this is just messy. And the only way I'm going to learn is by going scared and just doing it. Yeah. You just, you just got to do it. You have to understand. So uh, one of the things that I've learned more recently is that it's okay to invite the fear in. It's okay mm. to invite you know, that scare feeling in, because once you invite it in, that means you acknowledge it. Right. And once you acknowledge that you're afraid or that you're scared, then you're that much more positioned to move past it. Right. Right. And Instead so, of saying like, oh my gosh, this fear isn't supposed to be here. You know, yeah. I'll just say, oh, hey, you're welcome here. You don't get to be the boss of me. Yeah. It's but like, hey, here. I'm nervous about this and that's okay. And I'm yeah. going to do my best. And guess uh, what? That best is going to be enough because you are enough. Oh my gosh. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That is the best way to wrap up. Okay. So last question, although I feel like you, you just basically answered it, but we do like to ask our guests how they're going scared right now. So would yours be networking? And I mean, fundraising, I know that that can be a really scary thing to do. Congratulations on closing up your first round. Thank you so much. No, I'm actually going scared right now with scaling. So it's like yeah. we launched into Target. We're growing. So we launched in Target. It's such a small amount of stores. And within nine months, it's like we're going in 10 times the amount wow. of stores that we were initially in. And so it's like, okay, well, I was really good at being a small business owner. What does it look like, you know, being, you know, the founder and CEO of a, a business that's scaling and growing and, yeah. you know, am I right? Am I hiring the right people? Am I do? am I making the right decision? So, you know, I, I went through a period very, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, like very recently where I was just kind of like questioning and doubting everything. And that's why yeah. I say like, you know, it never stops. You never stop exactly. challenging yourself. Um, but also just knowing that it's okay. So like I dealt with it for about two weeks, like really trying to like dig deep on like why I had this fear or mm -hmm. why I felt like, you know, I, I wasn't capable of going from this small business to, you know, this mid-sized business. Right. And I was just like, it's just something that you've never done before. And of course right. that's scary and that's fine. And, you know, goals should be scary. Right. And so it's like, it's cool. You got this. Right. You got this. And like, the, all you can do is your best. I loved the vulnerability of this conversation, even how we wrapped up and Melissa really sharing how you don't just make this one choice to go scared when you start something, but there are a million decisions after that where you decide, am I going to let fear keep me seated or am I going to simply stand up and go scared? Melissa is doing that. So I hope that you go follow her and encourage her in her journey. You can find her on Instagram at Melissa R Butler, and you can head on over to the lip bar. I know I'm filling my cart with her most popular red color. And before we go, don't forget to head on over and buy imperfect courage on Amazon, or you can listen to it on audible as well. Our wonderful music for today's show is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kolfholtz, and I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.